Well, today I have a, a message for you that uh, in this crazy world that I hope will make you feel uh, significant. I hope it will make you feel valued and make you realize uh, um, just how, how much importance your life has in the overall scheme of things, as well as uh, maybe to put a good shot of hope and encouragement into you. The name of my message today is called The Power of One, the subtitle, which I'm always a subtitle guy. Uh, the power of a few. And I want to just show how important and how important and valuable your life is. And maybe we will take our lives and who we are and what we do more seriously. And uh, uh, probably um, there's a story in Israel about how they were run, uh, overrun, uh, being just attacked and everything from all sides. Uh, there was judgment, there were invasions, there were all kinds of crazy things going on. And uh, uh, God wanted, to, didn't want to allow what was happening to happen. And he said in Ezekiel, he said, I just look for somebody, Ezekiel twenty two thirty, among the people who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap in behalf of the land so I wouldn't have to destroy it, but I couldn't even find one person. And uh, it's like, God's always been looking for people. He works through people to stand in the gap, to repair holes, to hold back darkness, to convey in his truth. And uh, Israel ended up getting overrun. In other times, though, they were absolutely delivered. And I, I was thinking about the parallel we're on with our country around now, now is that uh, obviously our roots uh, and origins are intertwined, Israel and America, Christian nation, uh, Israel, the people of the book and the people of the law, and the two working together, one founded by God and the other one is a nation under God. But uh, we look at our country now and we look at it as much like ancient Israel was at the time. Uh, moral, spiritual condition, political position, uh, the borders completely being overrun. Uh, just craziness. Uh, we, we, we can't even follow anymore. So crazy and bad it's been. It, it's never been like this in the history of our entire country since the Civil War. And who knows what's next. I know one thing for sure. All of us, with grace, with faith, we got to be prepared for and expect the unexpected. Who knows what's coming next? We've seen things happen that we never believed could happen. And that's just the beginning of things that, that, are, that are coming down, even for our country and for the world. And, uh, but it's not a time to be afraid. It's not a time to shrink back. Um, it's a time to actually get excited because he's coming. He's coming back very soon. He says, when you see all this stuff happen, start to look up because it's gonna, <laughs> he says, I'm coming. And your redemption is drawing near and a whole new age will come. And uh, like I said, uh, in, in the role that God has planned for some of you, people don't realize, uh, will Rockford still be here in the millennium? Will there be people around getting married? Will people be getting saved? Will the world go on? Yes, it will. There's not gonna be a giant explosion and it all disappears and you get a harp and a halo and sit on a cloud. That's not what's gonna happen. Uh, and many people are distant. So here's the thing, you and I, we can see into the future. In fact, and there's, there's a way to be during these times where we're full of energy, we're full of hope, we're full of expectation. First Chronicles talks about when Israel was being overrun, there were some wise men and women around. First Chronicles 12 said from the tribe of Issachar, there were 1,200 leaders from that tribe and their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and they knew the best course for Israel to take. I will tell you, my name's not Issachar, but I've been around for a long time, and I think I'm going to share some things about how we need to be and what God wants to do and what your value is this morning that will help us be who we're called to be during these difficult times. Amen? You ready to hear it? Okay, some heavenly perspective. Meanwhile, God's in control. He sits above the circle of the earth. He can, the, the earth looks like a little, little tiny little ball and the nations look like dust on the scales. And yet, yet he's so intimate that he created an ant as well as a giraffe and an elephant. And he's got the hairs of your head numbered. He's in charge of every last thing. And it's good to know in this shakable world that we serve an unshakable God. Amen? And so... Uh, 
There are some things that are happening, though, that, you know, God, when Jesus left, he told his disciples, he says, he says, a lot of stuff's going to happen, tribulation, trouble, and everything else. But he says, occupy till I come back. Occupy means to hold the ground that's been entrusted to your life and to your care and hold it and don't give it up. Get it done until I come back. Hold your ground. And so you and I aren't to shrink back, put our heads in the sand, and just be victims. God wants us to be proactive about everything, and he wants us to use what we have uh, uh, to, 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 to hold our ground and to make a huge difference in his kingdom as these age comes to an end. And I, you want to know what something else that's awesome? In this insurmountable picture that we see in our country and the world right now, God absolutely, he doesn't love what's going on, but he loves insurmountable odds. He likes it when it's so bad, nothing can happen but bad. He loves it like Lazarus in the tomb, not three days. It, the Jewish people used to believe if three days the spirit kind of hung around the body before it left and went into its eternal state. That's what the Jews believe. But in the fourth, when the body started to decompose, the spirit left and it was beyond hope, beyond death, beyond, it was done. And I had a whole lady come to me once with a prophetic word when we, I was in a tremendous slump, life was in a slump, and she said to me, have you ever considered the fourth day? God is telling me to tell you to consider the fourth day when everything's so dead, so stinky, so rotten that nothing good can happen. He says, that's when he shows up with resurrection power to bring things that are not into something that has true being, true worth, and true value. He's telling that to you, and I'm going, okay. I like that. I'll take that one. And that's what he's telling us today. He loves where well, there's only a few people and insurmountable odds. He goes, this is what I've been waiting for. So don't look at things and go, what's the use? Those are lying demons or something futile coming from our own mind. God wants to do some awesome stuff. And I'm going to show you how valuable you are. Just your existence and your presence. And we'll take a familiar story from Genesis chapter 18. And uh, we'll pick it up. Uh, here's, what it, here's what it says. It's an amazing story. It's crazy when you break it down. Uh, the Lord appears to Abraham. He morphs into human flesh. Three men. Uh, it's a, a pre-incarnate appearance, Christophany they call him, of Jesus in his before the cross, back in, the, in his, one of his many appearances at key times in Israel history, he appears to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing by. When he saw them, he hurried from his entrance to the tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground and said, if I found favor in your eyes, look, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. It's very obvious to me that he realized something very special about these men. They come out of the desert. It's over 100 degrees. He's sitting in front of the tent. These guys come out of the dusty desert. He can sense a presence. He can sense something coming down, and he knows God's in it. And so he's starting to feel the vibe of the couple other times that God appeared to him. He senses that, and he goes, okay, this is a God thing. Here he says, come on. He says, and then he says this. He says, verse 4, let a little water be brought that you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. And let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said, do as you say. Abraham turned to, hurried into the tent to Sarah. He says, quick, get three seeds of finest flour and knead it and make some bread. Then he ran to the herd. He didn't walk, he ran. He was, in, he was, he was on it to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. He served them. So here's, this has to be the coolest thing. It's a hot 100 plus degree day. They're sitting there. Jesus is there in human flesh, pre-incarnate, and he's eating veal. And he had his feet washed and he's drinking water and Abraham's waiting on them, cooking them food and, and they're eating it. And they're sitting there like chilling. And I'm just going, I just soaked in that moment for a moment. What that must be like if Jesus like came over to my house and, 
It, oh my goodness. So anyhow, um, so <laughs> while they ate and stood near the tree, where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. They're in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, I am worn out after I'm worn out and my, wife, my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? <laughs> I can just see Sarah chuckling like, okay, now, now you're gonna do something? You know, when everything's whacked? You know, I remember doing this, it, it wasn't a childbearing thing, but I remember when the Lord led Karen and me to start this church, and I remember it was in a snowstorm blizzard, and I was backing a white van with a bunch of cheese ball PA equipment up to the Pine Island Elementary School, and I, I, no one was around, it was dark, and all of a sudden I felt sorry for myself. Okay, I says, God, I says, last week I was playing electric guitar with a cameraman watching me in a mega church, and now I'm back in a van full of crap up to an elementary school to start a church in a snowstorm, and I'm 50 stinking years old, and I don't, this, this, I, I just had a moment. I don't have many of those, but I had a moment. I actually even, Jonathan has this ministry, but I had tears running down my face. And I just felt so alone, so thing. But you want to know what? If something like that happens to us, we need to shake ourselves out of it. Because it's God in you working to will and do his good pleasure. If he's for us, who can be against us? If he calls you to do something, he'll give you what you need to be able to do it. So anyhow, but Sarah, she was having one of those Doug moments, okay? And she's going, I'm old, I'm, I'm tired, I'm, what the world? I was, when I was 25, I could change the world. One hand tied my back just to make it fair. And God goes, exactly, I didn't want that, okay? Um, but either way, um, um, now I'll have this pleasure. And then the Lord says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard to the Lord? I will return at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. By the way, he didn't return in the flesh. See, represented in that three trio there was the power of the Holy Spirit and he returned in the spirit and he did a supernatural miracle that allowed them to conceive and have a son. And he said, I will do this and it's gonna happen. And so this is just crazy. He says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Here it again is insurmountable odds. I just got arrested. I got arrested while I was reading this and I stopped and had a soaking Mother's Day moment. I thought of all the, the, you mothers and, and you ladies who are out there and, and who have longings in your heart for something you so desperately want to happen. Maybe you want a child so bad like Hannah uh, or, or maybe there's some other deep longing you have but it seems absolutely unattainable or impossible. And God's going, he, he, he sees you. I wrote these words. I, I forgot my message for a moment and pulled out a pen and actually wrote these words. Moms, he sees the pain and struggle you're going through. And like Hannah, who desperately wanted a son or she would die. Like Moses' mom, who had to take her little boy and let him go in a little basket and float down the river. She had to let him go. Or like Mary, who had Jesus and watched everything he went through and had a sword pierce her heart. Or a mother's deep regret over an abortion decision that was made that can't be reversed. He sees and feels the emotion over pain, mistakes, or whatever your need or state or season you're in as a mother. And there are others of you who have a deep longing in your soul that only a mother can have. And he wants to meet you. He wants to bring you joy. He wants to bring you fulfillment. He wants to bring a fresh sense of purpose to your life and give you hope beyond this moment and make you realize your extreme value in regard to his overall purpose. You know, I wrote those words down while I was in the middle of another thought and I stopped and then I was sitting and I thought, you know what, I'm going to put that right in the middle of my expository thing like a word and I wrote it down but then while I was writing it down the words of Eli the priest to Hannah who was 
deeply in prayer to God and said, God, whatever you want from me, I'll give it to you. Even my kid, I'll give him to you. Uh, but, but, and Eli talked to her and, and, and this is what he said to her when she told him her need. He said, whatever it is you're praying about, he says, may the Lord grant you your wish and may whatever it is that you desire happen and advance his kingdom. And I would say to you, God grant you, because I felt like it came to me like a word, that God grant you and will grant you and is granting and will grant you the deepest desires of your heart. There's a number of people here that you you need grace, you need comfort, you need provision. A number of you, you ladies, and I felt his compassion. And May the Lord grant you, this is the word to you, what you long for, what you desire, and may it advance his kingdom. I find it very interesting that this thing that I just did happened right in the middle of a very serious event. These men came, they were on a mission. They were on a mission that involved history and nations and destruction and, and fire and brimstone and, and huge things that made them come from their lofty place and take human form. But yet they took the time to address the personal lives of Abraham and Sarah And we can see in the back trail how that things that happen in our personal lives are very dear to God. He wants to give us a provision and that provision worked out has a place that affects history and it will affect yours, whatever God has and does with you and through you. So I found it interesting that they did this right here. And and Sarah, of course, I'm sure she learned her lesson. And a year later, it was happy Mother's Day for Sarah. And she remembered the meal. She remembered the laugh. And she just, she, I'm, I'm sure that was a very, very special thing for her. Now, when this was done, um, the men got up, verse 16, to leave at, after that incident. And they looked towards Sodom. And Abraham walked along with them along the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And Abraham will surely, he said, become a great and powerful nation. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children, his household after him, and keep the way of the Lord by doing what's right, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised. And then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see what they have done. And if it's as bad as the outcry that has reached me, if not, I will know. I find it very interesting that he is God who knows everything and holds everything by the word of his power. But yet, when it came right down to having to do something this drastic, he actually came into that environment so that he could experience and feel it. How many of you know that it's one thing to know everything about something, it's another thing to, to go and experience it. It brings full circle the reality and the fullness of everything that you need to know. I remember uh, going, reading and studying everything about elk hunting and the environment and everything like that. And I knew I studied every last thing I could about it. But then I got a chance to go to Oregon. I got a chance to walk and climb up in the mountains. I got a chance in this giant wild country to be a speck in the universe and experience what I already knew. And it brought it full circle. And this is what God did. He says, before I blow this whole place up, I'm going to get so close to it that I experience and know every last thing I need to do so that I can make a full judgment with full involvement and participation of the Godhead. I think it's amazing that God takes things that seriously. But that's what he did. In verse 22, the men turned away and went to Sodom. But Abraham, two of the guys, uh, and Abraham, the angels, and Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will the judge of the whole earth not do right? He knew who he was talking to. He was talking to God in the flesh. And he he, he very, I I bet his tone was not arrogant. (laughs) The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. He said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, good call. 
Stay humble, stay low when you're doing this kind of stuff. But what if the number of the righteous is less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke, what about 40? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. <laughs> what a Jew, he just wouldn't quit. You know, I'm part Jewish, I understand. You know, uh, he, says, he says, what if 30 are only there? He says, if I find 30 there, Abraham's still insecure. He goes, that place is rotten to the core. He says, man, I don't know. I better keep going here. He says, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? For the sake of 20, I won't destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. Man, this guy's pushing it. Will he, let me speak once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He said, for 10, I won't destroy it. Then the Lord finished speaking with Abraham, and he left, and Abraham went home going, there's got to be 10 good people in that whole place. There's got to be, but there weren't. Here's my first point, and it should make you and I feel extreme value. The presence of a truly godly person has tremendous spiritual influence that affects the events in our natural world, including the state of affairs and the political climate. A godly person, just their presence, just their existence, has more influence than all the, the, the voting and the citizen stuff and the protests and everything that we do. Being godly is the number one influence to changing your and my world and the political, spiritual climate of anything. Do you realize that nation after nation fell, but Jesus conquered the Roman Empire? In 300 years after his death, Constantine saw a cross in the sky and declared Christianity to be the religion for Rome. Through love, surrender, and grace, and dying martyrs whose blood became the seed for ongoing whatever, <laughs> love and grace and mercy conquered the longest empire that had ever existed. But either way, I, I wanna just say this, a truly godly person, what influence? The greatest thing you and I can do is be godly. And this is crazy. But now, I did a little study, and, and it's estimated that in Sodom and Gomorrah, those two cities, uh, were, there were about a half a million people, around 500,000 people, men, women, and children, 500,000 people. And, and, and that means 10 godly people would have had the ability to affect the lives of 50,000 people. Each life, each person, would have had, it doesn't matter if it's exact or not, but, but it's, they're somewhat similar. It means that one person's presence could affect and have value in relation to God's mercy for 50,000 people. It doesn't matter if it's 40, 30, or 60, it doesn't, but it's crazy how true this is. And um, God has always had a remnant of people. He's always chose to save many by a few. And I'm going to tell you what, even in, in Israel's, when they were completely overrun by Baal worship, which Baal worship was uh, the, the greatest enemy. He was the storm god, the god of fertility and climate. And, of course, Baal in Hebrew means lord or overseer. The Phoenicians called Baal Baal shaman, which means Lord of the heavens. But uh, he and his female counterpart, Ashtaroth or Asherah, whose face is on all your Starbucks cups, they, they had an immoral climate of immorality, child sacrifice, all the things, by the way, that are still going on today through abortion and everything else. And we have the blood of 70 million babies, innocents. Uh, uh, hanging over our heads. But, but in spite of all these different things, Elijah brought Baal worship to a screaming halt, shut it down cold with the fire of God's judgment, and he shut it down so all the people worshiped God and returned, and he did it. But later on, he was feeling sorry for himself. That was a heavy-duty day, and he's going, I'm so, I'm so alone, I'm so tired. He goes, but you don't see it right. I got a remnant. 7,000 people in this country have not bowed their knee to Baal or given him one ounce, one ounce of attention. 
So what he was really saying is, Elijah, you're the tip of a spear. It wasn't you. There's a remnant and that remnant had value. And I've shut everything down and changed the entire climate and atmosphere in this nation because of that. And there's other times in the Bible, we see this in 7,000 uh, and God having a remnant of people who, 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 uh, who the Bible calls stand in the gap, who repair the breach, who hold back judgment. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do some math here. Okay, if, if a person represents 50,000 people, okay, and the remnant represents 7,000, that's, that re, that's God's perfect number in a remnant. I says, what if I take each person representing 50,000, and I take 7,000, the number of the remnant, and I multiply it times 50,000, what do I come up with? 350 million. Well, what's the population of the United States? It's 350 million, give or take a few. So the question is, when you start boiling it all down, are there 7,000 godly people in the United States of America? There's not seven. There's not 70,000. There's 700,000. There may even be a million. But there's way more than 7,000 no matter what the number is. And that number is the number that God looks at when he decides what he wants to do. And when they stand and they occupy and they worship and they believe, God sometimes will bring judgment right in front of them. That doesn't mean it's all bad. He'll bring discipline, but it's not for destruction. It's for refinement so that he can bring mercy and pile out and do what he really wants to do in the wake of that. And that's what's going on in this country right now. Let me keep going here. I like this. We aren't talking about positional godliness either. How many of you know he chose you and me holy and blameless before him in love before the foundation of the world? If you're called and you're saved, it's a free gift, not based on anything you did. That's called positional righteousness and right standing with God, which is the key to our salvation. If you win the whole world, you're going to be wearing, waving your credit card. It's, it's by your grace and your blood that I'm saved, not anything I did. Amen? Okay, so that's positional. God's talking about people who have gone full circle and embraced that positional and walked out the sanctification process where they're godly in actuality with their position and the word of God. They've been transformed by the renewing of their minds to walk in grace and become in actuality what they symbolically and legally already are. Those are the, the, the 7,000. Those are the people that stand for 50,000 people or more or less. Those are the Daniels who can change history and bring empires to their knees. One man, a few. Let's, let's look at what this means. What then does this entail? If that's the kind of person, if that's what God is doing and he wants to do through us, what value do we have and what, what do we mean by godliness, godly people? Godly in right standing with God and in right living. Listen to this, Romans 13, 11. Paul says, this is all the more urgent for you to know how late the time is. He said this 2,000 years ago. How late the time is. What time do you think it is now? The time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation is soon to be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes. Put on the shiny armor of right living because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in darkness, wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, or immoral living, quarreling, jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let yourself Here's, it's important, don't let yourself think about ways to indulge evil desires. So here it is, here it is. Someone who has not only got a legal right standing with God and the free gift of salvation, but they've embraced his nature and by the renewing of their minds, their presence, those kind of individuals, 
Stand in the gap, as the song says, stand in the gap, coming boldly to his throne of grace. Stand in the gap, he'll hear you when you seek his face. Put your weapons to their use and believe and you'll produce. Stand in the gap till all hell breaks loose. The enemy will have to fold his hand because the army of the Lord, it steps up to take command because there's a weapon all hell can't stand. It's the fervent prayer of a righteous man. So I wanna just say it again, the biggest thing you and I can do in our world, just with our presence, is to be godly. Oh, next prayer and worship, I'm almost done. Jehoshaphat about to be overrun by seven kings in all the nations of Moab and Mount Seir. The overwhelming sea of enemies. And by the way, America has enemies on all sides, inside and out. It doesn't really matter. It's scary, it's important, it can be. But here's the bottom line. They were overwhelmed. They knew they couldn't do anything to stop what seems insurmountable. So what did they do? They worshiped and and, and prayed and fasted and then it says, and then there was silence and all those, they just stood in God's presence at the tabernacle tabernacle with their little ones, with their kids. And the word of the Lord came forward. You guys aren't even gonna have to fight. You just stand still and see what I do. And so the next day they hauled out their guitars and their cymbals and their drums and their harps and whatever else they had. Went out, kept their swords in the sheath and just start singing. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. The battle belongs to the Lord. Raise a hallelujah. And as they worshiped and just existed, we're just there. It says God turned the whole thing inside out and destroyed them all. And it says the last people killed each other and only a few people escaped on camels to say, don't go near that place. So what can God do with us? Under judgment, yes, but not for destruction. Under discipline, yes, but for refinement. What can he do this coming Friday night? We're having a fire night. It's gonna be an explosive night of worship and prayer and communion. I would that you would all be there. All four, all four campuses are coming together. Why? Do you think there's enough people in Cedar Springs, Rockford, Greenville, and Sparta as we pray and worship God to affect the entire region of West Michigan, hold back darkness, escape a lot of things that could come on us, and instead the grace of God so explosively goes into every street, every house, that no matter what, with the pockets of judgment that will come in this nation, that we will be spared and that his kingdom will be promoted because God's people just lived godly and just looked to him and stood together in unity. Do you want to see that happen? I do. It's our plan. It's a plan. It's his plan. His hand is on this whole region. I saw a map. I didn't see a map. I talked to, I heard about a map. I was talking to my son when he bought some property. And that family had been, the guy had owned it, his name was Abraham. And that land had been over 100 years in their family. And we knew about it and the old lady said, yeah. She says, I used to be part of an intercessory prayer team. And we prayed and we prayed and prayed. And then she said, God told us to get out a map. And he had us draw and he showed us how God was going to put divine protection on this entire region that it wasn't gonna be touched by plagues, judgment and things that are going to come on this country. And that was 50, 60 years ago. And so here's the deal, That's, that's just a, One story of many, but what I'm saying is, church, your value to God and your importance is so huge. And so, just want lastly, just take a stand. Stand, having done all, stand. And all Daniel and his friends did was stand. They didn't do anything special, no crusades. All they did was obeyed God and stood for his kingdom. And they toppled an empire so that Nebuchadnezzar said, From now on, everybody has to worship God because no God can deliver like this God. And so that's what my challenge is. Dare to be a Daniel, be godly church. It it matters for your life, your world of influence in the future, what's going on in the world here. And um, follow the Holy Spirit. There's some practical things you can do. 
Uh, ask him, God, what would you have me do besides in this hour? Because there is things that we can do. I was talking to my niece, Rochelle, who's our state representative, one of our state representatives. She was telling me how her whole life is gone since she became a representative. It's swallowed. I said, she said, my life is gone. I says, well, then you might as well run for governor in a couple of years because you have all the other things in your life shot anyhow. And, and, and we talked, and I actually uh, I gave her a, an encouraging thing, but here's the thing. Whatever it costs you, if the Holy Spirit's leading you, do it. <laughs> Don't stick your hand in the, in, the, in the sand. Step forward. Step up. Listen to his word and do it. You'll find an exciting life, a scary life, a life full of, fulfill, full of fulfillment. And you'll be excited and you will not be bored or scared. By the way, scared is fun when you're doing God's will. Because you know somehow you'll survive. Um, a last question, the last thing for the day as we wrap it up. My last point is, no matter what is happening, all that said, don't despair. Do not despair. Paul goes in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, he says, we're pressed down on every side. We're not crushed. We're perplexed. Sometimes we don't even know what's up. But we are not in despair. What is despair? Despair is any time, any situation that you're in, no matter how bad, big, or whatever, that excludes God from the equation. Don't exclude God from your equation because the words, but God, but God, you see it all through the Bible. It says, this is so terrible. This has happened, but God. He's your God. And the Bible says, if God's for you, who can be against you? He has a plan for your life. Go for it. Hell or high water, go for it with everything you had and do not despair. Any thought that says, what's the use, is from the devil or your own mind and things you've been seeing. Anything that says, I am helpless, I can't do anything, it's a lie of the devil. Every ounce of hopelessness, despair, discouragement, it's all from the enemy or dialed up from your past experience. It needs to be abandoned. <laughs> and we need to be fully in, excited and full of hope for an age that's coming to an end that you and I are gonna live forever. Shine like stars in the universe. And today is boot camp and training for all of that. When we view through the eyes of God and eternity, our mission here and now, it will change our perspective completely. And so that's what I wanna leave with you. And uh, I'll leave the verse. <laughs> We're going to close with a blessing in a moment. We're going to sing the blessing because God's blessing is on us. And he's for us. And his favor is going to be on us because we are eternal people. We're going to live even beyond this into the next age. People, I, I don't want to get into that. But anyhow, Jeremiah 29, 11, Israel was going through hell. Jeremiah comes along. You know what he says? It's tough, isn't it? No, he goes this. He says, for you know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, and to give you a hope and a future. That's his word to us today, in the middle of it all. So church, be filled with hope, be exciting. View life through the lens of eternity. 10,000 years from now, you'll be alive, shining like the sun, worshiping him, shining like a star in the universe. To use your spiritual influence like salt to change your world and us together change this entire region for his grace and his glory.